Several months ago, I did a community update video where I showed you guys some projects that people within the community have been working on. One of those was the Null from Ampersand. Really cool custom Raspberry Pi based gaming handheld that got a lot of attention from you guys on here and on Instagram, and for good reason. On top of just being a pretty comfortable and capable retro gaming handheld, it's just gorgeous. It uses this custom acrylic shell that lets you see all the components on the inside. So with how well received that was, it's no surprise that he's back with the Knoll 2. Today I'm gonna show you guys what's new and improved in this version, what goes into putting one together, as well as what I did to customize the look and feel of mine. Now, before I get to the good stuff, let me give you guys a quick update on what I've been up to the last several weeks, as well as a quick update on the Minty Pie. And if you don't care about this, feel free to skip ahead, you're not gonna hurt my feelings. But if you're a fan of the channel, then you might've noticed that I haven't uploaded anything in like almost two months at this point. You might also notice that the wall behind me looks a little bit different. That's because for the last several weeks, I've been working on converting my garage into a proper workshop. It's not quite ready just yet, you'll see more of it in some upcoming videos, but up until this point, everything that you've seen has been out of a relatively small bedroom, like 10 by 10 feet. And I had somehow managed to cram all of my 3D printers in there, I think I was up to seven at one point, my computer, my soldering station, all my tools, all my video equipment, all of that was crammed into that little room and it just made it a pain in the butt to work on anything, let alone to drag out my video equipment and to make a video out of it. So this new space that I'm in is about four times that size and it's gonna give me enough room to work on multiple projects at once have room for some new tools, which I'll show you one of those in just a minute. But what I'm most excited about is I'll be able to leave my video equipment up all the time. What that should mean is that you guys will start seeing more videos and projects from me more frequently. I am super excited about this and I hope that you guys are too. I thought about doing a quick video giving you guys a tour of the new space, show you guys what tools I'm working with now, what 3D printers, that kind of thing. And it's hard to believe, but we're actually coming up on 100,000 subscribers here, which thank you guys, by the way. But I thought about tying it in with that and doing some giveaways and some stuff like that. So if you guys would be interested in that, let me know in the comments below. Now, if you've been looking to get parts to put together a Minty Pie version three, then you probably know that Helder has been out of stock of his parts for a while now. Well, he's putting up another pre-order. So if you've been waiting for that, now is your chance to get in on that. Head over to his website and you can pre-order. I'm gonna have an update video pretty soon on that showing some common issues that people have run into, some little tweaks that we'll have for this next batch, that sort of thing. Uh, so keep an eye out for that as well. All right, back to the Null 2. As you can see, I customized mine quite a bit. I'll get into that in just a minute, but let me show you what's new and improved this time around. One of the big complaints that people had with the original Null was that it didn't have any kind of audio on it. Might not be an issue for you most of the time, but when that option is taken away altogether, you wind up missing it sometimes. He's gone above and beyond fixing it this time. We have not just one, but two speakers for stereo sound. We've got a headphone jack on the top, as well as the handy mute switch. Volume is controlled in software with a button combination. Pretty nice. The screen is a little bit bigger, up from 2.8 inches to 3.2 inches. It's still the same ILI9341 based SPI screen, so you can expect to get about 30 to 40 frames per second from it. Battery charging has been upgraded this time around with a USB type C port, which I'm happy to see popping up on more and more projects like this. Huge disclaimer though, not all USB type C chargers are created equally. Some of them are not safe to use with this charging board, particularly the one from the Google Pixel, which will just shove more than five volts down the line whether or not the device asked for it. So to be on the safe side, stick to using a USB type A to type C cable. This time around, you also have the option to use either clicky tactile switch buttons like the first one or silicone membrane style ones like on the DS Lite, which I prefer quite a bit. Now, let me answer a few questions that I'm pretty sure you guys are gonna ask anyway. First, how much is it? Well, the kit from Ampersand is $50 on Tindy. If he's out of stock right now, then sign up for the mailing list over there. That's how he gauges how much demand there is and whether or not he should order another batch of them. And that includes all the electronics except for the Raspberry Pi, the battery, and the SD card. The acrylic parts are separate, I'll explain that in a minute, but those are gonna run you about $45 as well. So all in, you're looking at about $110 or so for this project. With the recommended 1000 milliamp hour battery, I got about two hours and 40 minutes with Wi-Fi disabled on the Super Metroid demo loop, and it recharged in a little over an hour. I know a lot of you will probably ask if it's comfortable to play on, and yes, it surprisingly is. The edges might be a little bit sharp, but it's not bad and it actually kind of reminds me on playing a DS Lite back in the day, which I played the crap out of. 
What all games can it play? Well, it's a Pi Zero based system, which I've shown several of on this channel now. So you can expect to play pretty much anything from Game Boy Advance, Super NES, and back. PS1 and N64 will not run well on it, and it doesn't even have the buttons for it anyway. All in all, I'm a big fan of this project. It improves over the original in every way, is pretty affordable as far as these kinds of projects go, and it has a lot of room for customizability as well. That said, it's not perfect, but none of these kinds of projects are. My biggest gripe is the software. Out of the box, the pre-made RetroPie image only lets you adjust the volume and trigger a safe shutdown with the function button. You can't do things like toggle Wi-Fi on and off with it. I actually wanted that feature bad enough that I coded it up myself and added it to Ampersand's function button script. I sent it to him, so hopefully it makes it into a future version. Additionally, I was seeing some weird slowdown in some Super NES games that I definitely haven't seen on other Raspberry Pi Zero-based setups. I'm not sure if this is an issue with the libraries that he's using for his function button script or what, but it was pretty noticeable. The good news is that's all software and can definitely be fixed in the future. I'm sure of this because we know pretty well what the Raspberry Pi Zero is capable of, so I really wouldn't worry about that too much. And by the way, if you're not following him on Instagram, then you should be. He's got some pretty cool projects that he's working on. This is called the Peanut, and it's an Arduboy clone. The Arduboy is a tiny open source Arduino based handheld with over 100 games made for it at this point. His doesn't require any laser cutting or printed parts. It all kind of snaps together with header pins. Looks really cool, so yeah, that's the kind of stuff that he's been working on. I'll put a link in the blog post below uh, to the forum thread where he announced that, so if you have any questions about it, you can ask him there, or just shoot him a message on Instagram. Now let me give you an idea of what goes into putting a Null 2 together and what I did to customize mine. It is a do-it-yourself project. These are all the parts that you need for it. As I said before, the kit from Ampersand comes with most of the electronics to put it together. You just need to add in a Pi Zero, SD card, and a battery. You'll also need to get the parts to put the shell together. I know it might seem annoying to have to get those parts from a second source, but this actually gives you a ton of room for customization. Ampersand has design files that you can download and cut yourself, or upload to sites like Ponico to get cut for you. And they have a bunch of options for different materials and colors too. They charge about $45 for one full set. And I actually wound up getting a CO2 laser as a result of doing this video. So I also have those parts in both wood and acrylic pre-cut for purchase. Yes, I know that's a shameless plug, but links are in the blog post. Putting the PCB together is easy and straightforward, and Ampersand's guide is pretty comprehensive. In fact, if you're new to electronics projects, I think this would be a great one to help you practice your soldering. Nearly everything is a modular, off-the-shelf component. For example, this is the audio board with headphone jack, and this little board is the amplifier. Everything attaches directly to the PCB by feeding solder through the pinholes, and there are pads on the PCB to test and make sure you got a good connection. The hardest part for people, I think, will be attaching the Raspberry Pi to the PCB. But the good news is there is a cheap, disposable set of boards designed by Helder that you can use to practice this very thing. You can get them straight from Oshpark, I'll link to them in the blog post. That'll let you practice this kind of soldering before trying it on actual, more expensive parts. The screen is another part that might look intimidating to some people. Just use plenty of flux and the solder flows right onto the pads. I went ahead and covered the white border around the screen with an oil-based black paint marker. I'll show you those in a minute. Just makes it look nicer when it's behind that acrylic when you're done. The case is made up of two thin pieces for the front and the back, and two thicker pieces that act as spacers for all the electronics in the battery, with the PCB itself sort of sandwiched in between them like you see in this diagram. I didn't have my laser yet when I put it together, but my brother was nice enough to let me use his to cut, etch, and slightly customize mine. I used acrylic for the front and back, but then I used wood for the thicker spacers. I just used some cheap poplar sheets from a home improvement store, and they came out really nice. I especially like the charred edges. Then I stained it with some pretty standard wood stain. I lightly sanded them, applied the stain, and wiped it off after 15 minutes or so. I love how these came out, it looks so nice. Now, if you were doing all acrylic, 
This is the kind of solvent that you would use to weld the back plate to the back spacers. I'm using acrylic and wood, so I needed something that would work with both of those materials. I tried several glues and this is what I settled on. It cures crystal clear and does not fog up the acrylic in the process like super glue would. It's nice and thick so you can spread it out on the spacers, line it up and just clamp it down. Now another thing I really like about this glue is that you can come back to it in five or six hours and it'll still be soft enough that you can peel off the excess to get nice clean edges. Works great, but be really careful with the thin pieces. I used a piece of perf board to clamp those down without breaking them. Now you do not need to attach the front spacer with the front plate. I went ahead and did that anyway though, so that I would get that nice glossy finish on the front wood spacer. One thing I wish I had done differently, peeling the glue away from the edges also takes away some of that charred surface. I wish that I had masked that off, uh, but I wound up sanding it down and stained the edges and it wound up looking nice anyway. Now for the buttons, these are the bases. They're wider than the buttons themselves so that they won't fall out from the shelf. They have this circle etched into them so that you can easily line them up in the exact center. On my setup, the wood spacers were a little thicker and the front and back plates were a little thinner, so I wound up having to double up on these bases. The D-pad has one of those bases as well. So here are my actual buttons, which I cut out of wood. I wanted to color them and I tried a few options. Wood stain didn't color them deep enough for my liking. I tried just a plain old Sharpie, but when I added glue, it separated the dye. Kind of cool looking, but not what I was looking for. Then I tried some oil-based paint markers. The Sharpie brand one discolored after I put the glue on. Uh, this brand worked great though. I'll put an Amazon link to it in the blog post. It coated nice and thick and didn't discolor when the glue was applied, but for the black, the Sharpie brand paint marker worked just fine. Now I didn't want to leave the buttons flat, I wanted to add a rounded cap to them like this. Kind of like what you'd see on an Xbox. Believe it or not, this same glue is what I used for that. I applied a large drop of it and the surface tension forms it into a nice dome. Works surprisingly well. Now, if you get a bubble in there, what you can do is use a toothpick or something to pull the bubble to the edge and use a lighter to quickly heat it up and pop the bubble. Now the D-pad is gonna make a mess, but we can clean that up later. Here's what they look like when they're done. Super happy with the results. They came out nice and round. They almost look like they were machine made. No idea how well they'll hold up over time, but so far, so good. As far as actually putting it together, the hardest part is just making sure everything is all clean. I use some of these wipes to clean off fingerprints from the acrylic without scratching it and some canned air to get the dust out. It's very hard to get all the dust out. You will probably miss some. It's just the nature of this design really. Now, the reason these don't sit flush on mine is because I used a thinner front and back plate. But I don't mind, because that means I can set it down without scratching up the back. And there we go. Like I say, it's a very approachable project for newcomers to the hobby. I think if I weren't filming it, it would have taken less than 30 minutes to assemble the PCB, and not much more than that aside from drying time from the glue to put the rest of it together. So what do you guys think of this one? What kinds of material and color combinations do you think would look good for it? I saw that on Ponico, you could even get the front and back sheets cut out of metal. Obviously, you'd want to cut out the screen portion as well, though. Let me know in the comments below. Like I say, keep an eye out for more videos more often from me. And if you've been looking to get a hold of parts to make a minty pie, now is your chance. Head over to Helder's website and you can pre-order over there. Anyway, that's it for this one. As always, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.